What's up? Hello. Hello. <laughs> there was someone here. I hope they come back. Oh, good. There's someone here now. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Channel Earth live stream. Starwin Earth Stork here. Alien Matter here. What's up? <laughs> Look at this beautiful blue sky today. Well, oh, those patterns are amazing in the clouds. Yeah. Hopefully they're not chemtrails. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm gonna go there. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, thank you for tuning in, and we're here in Ohlone Land. <clears throat> Wichin, I think, is the name of the the place here in the um, East Bay, so called California. And um, just want to acknowledge the person viewing right now. Thanks for being here, and anyone watching this later. Thank you for tuning in with us and uh, thank you to your ancestors and I want to thank my ancestors uh, for bringing me here to this place with my amazing friend, Alien Matter. <laughs> so thank you to your ancestors too. Thank you to your ancestors. And you. And you. <laughs> and nice makeup, by the way. Thanks. Those dots are amazing. <laughs> Can we get a close up? Dang. Yeah. What? Went all out for nature. You know. <laughs> We're always trying to impress nature. So um, the topic that I was thinking we could start with today is on um, how to make rain gardens. And um, especially living in so-called California, there's a lot of drought cycles. And so channeling the rain that does come and, and utilizing it and putting it back into the aquifer is like, a great passion of mine. So I have two different, uh, actually, maybe three, dif three different rain gardens that I'd love to share with y'all. And then maybe we can talk about some of the plants we find in here too. Um, so yeah, how does that sound to you? Yeah, that sounds great. And the beautiful thing about yeah, rain gardens is when you store the water in the soil, you have to water less when you're trying to grow plants in the spring because the plants, they're just digging deep with their roots to search for that winter water beneath and it helps the plants grow strong and resilient. They're working hard for it. So that's how sweet tomatoes are grown, dry farm tomatoes and squash are grown when they just work really hard to search for that water underneath. Yes. And, and one thing that when I learned this, it kind of blew my mind about how, um, how soil and plant communities work in unison together, where if, if you're pulling all the weeds out, then um, it actually makes it harder for moisture to gather in the soil. And um, when, the, when plants are in the soil with their roots in the soil, the roots together, the plant community roots actually hold the water in there. So it's, it's funny, like I remember being taught originally that like, oh, pull the weeds because they're competing for the water with the other plants. And yeah, there's definitely examples where the weeds could completely take over and push out another plant. But oftentimes our, our weed friends, our invasive friends like, um, can't see if we can. Um, Oh, the shadow, shadow. <laughs> <laughs> little plantain guy there um uh it's what we made our salve with last it's like a really common weed that you know pops up and their their roots all the weed roots help hold the moisture in so super mm -hmm. grateful for for and, the weeds and the weeds are also um they give information because um the weeds come and go in different cycles um they the soil knows what it's lacking so these weeds pop up to help replenish the soil and then once it has enough say like nitrogen then another succession of another type of plant will come in so they just come in cycles like they know what they're doing <laughs> yes um so I'm not a purist at all with, um, like, I, I try to prioritize native plants whenever I'm uh, able to steward a space with folks. Like, I, I prioritize them. But, um, 
I, I, I'm also paying attention to the weeds that are there and I'm also planting medicinal plants and food plants besides just native plants. Um, so native plants for food and medicine and culture and then also plants from many different origins. So here's another plant I wanted to introduce you to which is ashwagandha right here. Again, so maybe let me move out. I'm in the shadow. <laughs> this is a small ashwagandha plant. So cute! Actually, Alien Matter gifted this, this plant relative to me. I'm so grateful. And they're growing a lot of new leaves. They're very happy we had our first rains. Yeah, excited for the first rain. Mm. And um, so, yeah, like when I'm planning a rain garden, um, what I start off thinking about is, um, and person listening, if you can't any point, would you mind just letting me know in the chat? <laughs> Because I know my speaker might not be that great through the mask. But um, yeah, first paying attention to the rain gutters on the roof and where the rain is being channeled to in a home. And this is a place I rent. So um, I try to think of it as no matter where I'm living, putting, putting love into the aquifer and soil through compost and rain gardens is just sort of like a practice I try to implement also as a way to give thanks to the water cycle there and the water and give thanks to the make offering to the soil. So, you know, uh, it's obviously nice if you can build really dope rain barrels and everything at a home that you know you'll be in long term, but um, you can adapt a lot of existing structures. Apartments would be definitely more challenging, but um, watching where the water's flowing off a roof is gonna give you an idea of where you can then channel it into the earth. So I'll show you the system here. So this is very DIY, but it, it works, you know, so you have to play with your investment and like how much money you do, you can afford to put into a rental place, for example. But this is all material I had sitting around here I found on the property. So it's the rain, um, the rain gutters channeling water off the roof. And then uh, this is a PVC pipe attachment that fits fits onto the uh, rectangle here and then and then I just found this um this gutter <laughs> so the rain channels off the roof into the gutter and then I dug a spiral garden over here so this is the early stages of the rainy season so it's going to start getting more and more lush as the rain keeps coming and soaking in thank you shout out to rain gods lalak Maybe you have a different name. Lalak's the name in Nawa. Um, so yeah, this is a rain spiral that I dug. So the path of the rain comes down here and then um, basically dug out a channel that spirals this way all the way inside here. We have a little more answer from Cynthia. Shout out to Arte. Um, maybe I should take this off the top here <laughs> if it's easier. Um, <clears throat> so I dug out the channel and then I put rocks inside the channel. I found rocks off of, um, Craigslist. So some basic gravel, um, rocks, <laughs> gravel and rocks. You can usually find them from like a build site that people are trying to get rid of rocks and you can just go with buckets and fill up. Sometimes I have bought river rocks at Home Depot, but I always feel really weird about it because I'm not sure how those rocks were taken and I doubt they were taken in a good way. So I'm trying to just do secondhand rocks, um, <laughs> AKA our ancestor stones. Um, so yeah, now the trench has a lot of leaves in it and you can't really see the rocks so much, but the rocks do help retain moisture in the early stages of the rain garden. And then, um, and then I want to show you just some of the native California riparian plants that are good in rain gardens. So here you have um, sticky, monkey sticky monkey flower. So cute. And um, there's some that are water loving and some that are more drought, drought, uh, mimulus, I think is part of its Latin name. So um, I got a sticky monkey flower. This is a, a, a reed called juncus. And it, it has rainbow colors. It's so beautiful. 
That's a nice sound too. It's like an instrument. Yeah. Crunchy. And and that one I found actually on the side of a road. Um, a local nursery, Wetlands Nursery, was giving away a bunch of little baby baby guys. Um, and they were just free for the taking. So I brought them here. Only two of them made it. The rest of them, I think, were already too dry by the time I got them home. Um, but also in that find was a native mugwort right there. And let's see if I can get a close-up. They're so beautiful. And they smell so good. Can you smell the mugwort? <laughs> <laughs> And then the native one up here is, um, yeah, it's like silvery white and the leaves are a lot smaller than the native one from Tonga land. Um, and oh, they're, they're, so um, they're in the Artemisia family. So uh, they are in the same family as also the California sagebrush. All have really amazing medicinal properties. Um, antimicrobial, good for, good for your lungs, right? Yeah, good for um, dream medicine also. They open the third eye intuition plants. So if you're wanting to connect to your intuition, growing mugwort in a place that will get a lot of water is great. And they do 100% they do well in drought summers because mm -hmm. they are, they're from here, they're from California. So they, they can hang and go dormant in the summertime. And then once the rains come, they just perk up and so fragrant so fragrant mm. yeah i wish you could smell this right now this beautiful mugwort <laughs> thank you mugwort um so again this was a plant found on the side of the road abandoned and several of their siblings did not make it but but this one did so it's planted in the rain garden getting nourished here and it's already getting new shoots from a fallen um branch so cute. Um, and then another one black here. Sage. Oh, it's black sage. You got it. Um, as you can see, this black sage is flowering and has seed <laughs> happening. Um, so it's been getting plenty of moisture here, even in the, in the dry season. And the mugwort is over here hanging out. So these are friends, plants. There's different plant communities that really like growing together. And mugwort and black sage, I think, are BFFs. I don't want to speak for them, but they really like each other. And like I, each other. I find them together hiking when I go hiking in riparian zones. So riparian zone is just a fancy way to say river zone. And, and yeah, it is really cool. You can tell when there's a riparian zone in the middle of a dry area. If you see a lot of trees and just like green, you know there's a water source out there. Yes. So <laughs> And the cool thing in California, the riparian zones might appear dry, like there doesn't seem to be a creek or stream. However, underground, there's going to be that water collected with the rock ancestors and with the plant communities holding the water in so there can be an arroyo seco a dry stream but um still plenty of water underground so the riparian zones you can cultivate in your yard just based on where the rain's falling so the rain's going to come off the roof and hit this spiral and then all these plants are so happy and they're so helping to keep the water in the soil sorry for the rocky camera balancing my laptop <laughs> Um, and if you have any questions as we're introducing plants or talking about the way we've been cultivating the rain gardens, please feel free to, to pop them in the chat and we'll, we'll happy to answer any questions um, about, about anything really that we can. And um, this is a beautiful mugwort flower, the bloom. So good. So that's, that's one style. And, and you can see, I just left the PVC pipe like exposed. But as, as it gets green, um, the greenery is going to start covering over it. So you won't even see that in the springtime. Um, so back here is another rain spiral I made. This one is not channeling water off the roof. It's just channeling water from the sky into a little ditch that I dug. So let's see. That's another black thing.
see it. Put this down. So for this for this riparian zone, hi, shout out to MB Generator cameo in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just really like to dig up a new um, a new area that's new to me. Um, there was only grass growing here, different invasive species of grass. So digging it up, creating creating a contour for the water to collect and then piling the rest of the soil up into these little mounds. And then in these mounds is where I planted the native plants. So this is another black sage right outside it's of the doing bedroom. so well. So pretty. If we can Look get at it. all the new shoots that are coming up. Oh my goddess. The old one. You're oh so amazing. Gosh. Love you. Um, and I've shared this in, in a few different forms before, but if, if you haven't heard it yet, this is an incredibly powerful bronchial medicine for your lungs, pulmonary system, throat, um, but it's triple X. So you only want to take one leaf a day maximum, and you don't want to take it for more than a few days because it's, it's a blood thinner. So be very careful with this plant, but it is super potent. It, it can reduce tumors. It's um, anti-cancerous and only to be taken with extreme caution. And as long as there's like, I, I run anemic, so I have to be super careful. This will make me more anemic. Um, so it's an emergency only plant. Um, but you can also, you know, make salves from it. And it's, it's really healing for cuts and skin and things like that too from the leaves not taken internally. So internally, black sage is only emergencies, um, but it is super potent, powerful medicine. Thank you, black sage. Mm, thank you. Mm, I can smell it. I can smell it huh? <laughs> if only YouTube would release an ability for you to smell. <laughs> like a scent channel. <laughs> a scent channel. I guess it would have a whole new system. <laughs> Sending you black sage medicine. And actually, if you if you want any, please let me know. I have so much growing here. I think we have six different plants. Wow. Um, so it's one of my favorites that when I first moved to a place in California, I try to grow black sage as a emergency medicine. Um, okay, another favorite in this little riparian zone in the backyard is yerba santa. And I think I introduced that one in the garden tour um, from our first Channel Earth video. Um, the cool thing about Yerba Santa is that it's also a bronchial medicine and it, it reduces phlegm. And I've used it a lot since our first garden tour video. And just one leaf, making a tea with one leaf and letting it sit for four hours before drinking it. And it's super, it clears any kind of phlegm in the throat. And this one is not as triple X, like it won't thin your blood. So it's a little bit more accessible. I think it's a little bit easier to use than the black sage, but it would also be very helpful if someone has COVID-19 to help clear the phlegm. That's yerba santa. You're so beautiful. Look at the new life coming. Here's the old seeds. Maybe they'll have some babies, some old leaves. And when you're picking a leaf, you know, you want to make an offering to the plant first and ask permission. And um, I usually offer my breath. And I, I'm always whispering sweet nothings to this one. And I, I pick usually one of the most green, bright green bendy leaves for the tea, as opposed to these that are older. And I actually um, sometimes come and just prune off the old ones if they're okay with it and they give permission. One way you know if they're giving permission is if it comes off easily. And if you're struggling to really like yank it, then it, it's telling you it doesn't want that to come off. Okay. All right. So thank you, Yerba Santa. Um, so yeah, these plants are benefiting from the contours because the contour provides shadow. And so if the sun's beaming down in the hot summer, there's always a little bit of shadow and that shadow is what's helping to cultivate the aquifer and the rain there. Yard. Bear with us. Hopefully the internet doesn't go out. Ooh, look at the oh, let's take a pit stop here. Hi, Sempa Sochi. Wow. Mm. 
this is the ancestor. I guess it's turning into a garden tour, <laughs> <laughs> which makes me want to do one at your house too, Aileen. Um, this is the ancestor garden. So it's a point of prayer to ancestors, ancestors of the land here and my ancestors um, and also ancestor spirits that are coming from my housemate community, anyone around, a place to just remember to connect and thank ancestors. This is a really wild plant here. Let's see. If, oh yeah, over here it's blooming. Looks like or like it's actually um, wormwood. Wormwood. It's Whoa. what they make some from. That's so interesting. It looks very similar. Let's try it. smelling it. It's such a strong scent. Also in the Artemisia. Family. Also in the Artemisia. Dream medicine. The. The, um, the wormwood was growing in my in my veggie gardens what? as a volunteer. Wow, that's so cool. And the veggies did not like the wormwood. So some plants like mugwort and black sage are friends, and then other plants are like, "Please get out of my space. It's very I powerful. do not like your vibes." <laughs> so I had to move wormwood out of that bed. But the wormwood and the sempasochi seem to be totally fine. They're both um, both plants that ward off insects too. The wormwood, you can make a um, like an insect repellent from it, as well as absinthe. So the flowers I put over there for the ancestors. Okay, so this is the the next rain garden, and um, this same thing. I kind of was observing the front yard. In the very front, I put a, a native meadow, and then um, I knew that part would be getting more sun. And then this part that stays in shadow half the day, um, I dug a trench and it ended up being in the shape of a heart. And so it's a little, it doesn't translate as well. But if you're here, what you can tell is the land goes in in the trench and it's filled with rocks in the shape of a heart. And then the soil is kind of piled up in the center. So maybe if we keep it ground level, maybe they can see the, the elevation. A uh, little hard to see. Oh, well. But, um, yeah, so it's a trench, and where I dug up the trench, I piled the soil on top in the center. And then this is where we grew our milpa this year. So I have fava beans as a nitrogen fixer all around the trench, the trench filled with rocks, which is the riparian zone here, the front yard. And we also deposited a lot of compost. So we dug um, five different locations and as our compost bin in the backyard, which is a trash can with holes in the bottom, as that filled up, we would just put all of the co contents in it, even if they weren't fully broken up yet, um, because it'll be like a slow release of nutrients for whatever's growing here. So you don't want to plant stuff directly necessarily on top, although you can, but um, we would plant stuff like on the side of it. So in less than a year, or no, in one year since I started that maybe 13 months, this front yard, which was all invasive grass before pretty much, um, is now this healthy biome, rich, fertile soil just from those compost deposits. So in one year, you can, you can grow so much riparian habitat and healthy soil. And I don't know what I'm doing half the time. It's just a lot of play <laughs> and intuition of like, I'm going to hold the moisture in even more. And so then you plant your seeds on the side of the valley where it starts going up into the berm. And the seeds, as they're growing, the roots will reach down underneath the, the rock ancestors for that moisture in the summer, in the, in the dormant dry periods. And then in the wintertime, it's just this really lush garden um, growing so much life here. So I have, in this part, I have some, some native plants. Those are clarkias, those pink flowers in the middle. I just kind of stuck, stuck a stick in to, to poke holes in, and then I sprinkled a lot of lupin seeds. So this is going to keep creating flowers. It was inspired, actually, by um, the, the Nahua mythology of the Flower Mountain when they were migrating to Atzlan, or from Atzlan, um, down to Tenochtitlan, or Mexico City. There's a, a really beautiful mythology and painting of the Flower Mountain. So I wanted to create a flower mountain here in the middle of the riparian zone. Um, and, and yeah, you just, uh, 
I pull some weeds sometimes, other times no, but wherever I pulled the weeds last time, then I put the seeds in. So they're gonna hopefully spread after this last rain we had. And then, yeah, I'm growing fava all around the exterior. Like every month or so, I put in a few more fava seeds. So then I have a regular harvest. And they also put, pick, put nitrogen in the soil. And then here's healthy arugula. So the arugula is loving it in this riparian zone and providing so much delicious food. Um, this is like 10th generation from seed I had in, in Congo land. So it's very drought tolerant also. And uh, we have constant salad. I love arugula for constant salad. Um, as, as we were growing the corn, also we had a lot of squash. And, um, and then the corn, I just recently pulled them out. And again, where I pulled out the corn stalks, I put in seed for fava and lupin. So we're gonna have an, a cool cycle. It's amazing here in California, we can, in this part of California, we can grow uh, year round. Um, so yeah, that's kind of this. When in, in the summer months, when it was really hot, all I had to do is bring the hose on one end and it, the water would fill up the, the riparian zone around the flower mountain. So it was like a little river zone and it would stay moist for, for like five or six. I would only have to water once or twice a week, even in, a, in pretty hot days, although it, it never gets as hot here as it does in Tongva land. But this is a great method for saving water and, um, and creating super nutrient rich pockets of soil and moisture. So, do you eat the flowers? Yes, you can eat them. Mm. <laughs> I shouldn't eat right off the plant, I guess. That's not COVID safe. Uh oh. I'm gonna lose power, so let's go connect again. Um, I guess that's pretty much it. Here's the rain barrel. Getting water. <laughs> um, I'm five foot two, Cute. so this is how big. <laughs> Cute rain barrel pick. <laughs> I got that off of Craigslist, but a lot of cities and towns are giving oh, away yeah. rain barrels. So um, here's the connection. If you if you have a gutter, you can um, connect it directly. Like usually they have some sort of connector to let the rain go directly out into the ocean or under into the sewer. But what you can do to intervene is to, yeah, take this part and just divert the water into the rain barrel. And then in the summertime, I got to use our water. Um, they're, they're not too expensive. They're not too hard to make, but you just want those connections of the different plumbing pieces to be, to be super good. So, um, so yeah, that kind of wraps up our tour. Um, does anyone have any questions? What's up? What's up, Galactica? Shout out to Galactica here. Bless our waters, yes. Um. Uh, what's up? <laughs> So um, I wanted to ask you, Alien Matter, what's your system for, for growing soil and aquifers where you live? Um, so fortunately, very fortunately, there's a water source right next to our yard. So, and so when there's no water, we can um, take some of the water from the stream and divert it into the garden. And um, I have been growing fava beans as well to um, grow uh, nitrogen in the soil. Uh, I'm doing, um, cut, yeah, cover, like um, just mulching, cover. like what you see with your straw. <laughs> there's some, there's a big like pile of bale of straw right there. Um, to, so like what straw helps retain uh, water, you can put it on top of your soil. Um, and when you water, it uh, prevents or it'll like slow down the uh, water evaporation rate. Um, so you don't have to water as much. So actually before the rains this past 
Tuesday? Was it Tuesday? Yeah, I like mulched my winter uh, beds right before and then the rains came and I didn't water once and my little bok choy are just growing new leaves. I'm such a lazy gardener. Me I, too. <laughs> I love like letting nature do their thing and not <laughs> even like trying too hard yes about it. yes it's it's so funny like the things that we're taught like are you need to water every day or you need to use irrigation systems like I really am not a fan of drip irrigation but I'm not doing commercial farming operations and I totally get it for that but um there's ways to grow aquifer and water without needing to water every day or install a drip system I just don't like all that plastic extra plastic in the soil but um and I'm not very good at fixing them. So yeah, I'm a lazy hands-off gardener too and just using systems for, for water together and um, growing comp, just dumping. Like Olivia taught me about it actually. Um, Olivia taught me about working with soil. Diane, I'm gonna get to your question in a moment, okay? Um, Olivia uh, taught me about just gathering food scraps and digging a hole and putting them in the soil, just like that. Like you don't even need a complicated turning system, although that's a way to generate healthy soil even faster. But, um, but even just depositing your goopy kitchen scraps in the soil is a, a really easy, easy way to give back, put nutrients back. Since we're taking them as we eat food all the time, just putting them back is super healthy. So, in this intergalactic universe, how do you live in harmony with natural predators? You know, that's a great question. <laughs> um, like, I guess if I, if I turn to the plant communities, there's going to be some plants, like we mentioned earlier, that, that grow well and in harmony with each other, and they, they find a way to coexist. And then there's other plants that really repel each other. So I guess, I guess following this, the lead of plants, it's sort of like, um, you know, move with the community that helps you grow and just take space from the soils that feel toxic to you. I don't know. What do you think? Um, I don't know. I think about the way that people like in society perceive things that are bad, like weeds or like for me, I'm dealing with a lot of raccoons and gophers and they really <laughs> come at the plants. But I have to realize that, you know, they are part of our system and they need to survive as well. So they come to a, they come to me because maybe their ecosystem doesn't have enough to provide for them. So they come and I don't mind sharing because it like we all live on this planet and we all deserve to live. And, um, and I'm just thinking about a lot of, you know, these animals that also, I guess, like, can be seen as predators to my food, like the deer that eat all the flowers. And just knowing that they've been here, they've been living on the land that I'm on, like, way before me appreciate that we're yeah we're not the only ones who, who use the land great answer on that note i think of our live stream so thank you and we we love you thank you for all your medicine human animals and hope you're having a, an enjoyable afternoon connecting to your habitat after this lots of love bye